I have this very important message. Time is of the essence. I need to get it all the way over there. 180 years ago, there was no option but to manually carry the message to the other side. Today, we're gonna see if we can recreate the first technology that changed this forever. Instantaneous communication. We take it for granted today, but in the past, wars have been fought after they'd already ended, and people needlessly died in conflicts that had already concluded. But that changed with one simple invention. In this video, we're gonna explore exactly what it takes to build the very first telecommunications network. While this device seems pretty simple, actually building a working device from scratch with all of the components for it that can actually operate over a long distance is not going to be an easy task. But ultimately, this is a great grandpa of the internet and everything we use today. And this is gonna be the first and biggest step to actually achieving that. Let's get started. The history of the telegraph is fascinating. First up, the electric telegraph is not the first form of the telegraph. Since early history, humans have found various ways to communicate information over distances. From smoke signals to signal fires, they all offer a form of rapid communication, but are limited to the messages you can send. Pretty much limited to just good knuckles for eight. The optical telegraph was invented in 1792 in France and operated by towers with telescopes relaying messages between them using semaphore arms to spell out different messages. But this invention was quickly outpaced by a new discovery, electricity. The uses for electricity in the beginning were pretty limited, mostly serving as parlor tricks for parties by Benjamin Franklin or as a method to kill turkeys. However, quickly people realized the great speed that electricity can travel and very soon were experimenting with various ways to try and send a message through it. As early as 1753, the idea of the telegraph began for sending letters via electrostatic over distance. Earliest concepts involved using wires for every single letter, eventually simplifying to a six wire system which could point to specific letters. However, around the same time, Samuel Morris invented a similar system using his Morris code that required just a single wire. Its simplicity and lower installation costs quickly made it the standard around the world. But first, thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Fabric by Gerber Life. If you're a parent, you want your kids to grow up happy, successful, and financially independent. But investing can often be confusing and time consuming. Fabric makes it easy for you to set up an investment account for your child that will grow with them and helps prepare for their financial future. Fabric was designed by parents, for parents, to make it easy to plan and manage your family's financial path. With the kids' investment account from Fabric, you can start investing in your kids' future today. While your kids can't invest while they're minors, a UGMA kids' investment account allows you to invest on their behalf giving their investment more time to grow. So an account takes just five minutes with as little as $1 a day. Then you can manage your child's account and monitor their investments right from your phone. One of my best privileges in life is that my grandparents actually started a fund like this when I was a child and that helped me actually afford college. This is a great opportunity to offer that to your own children. Fabric has partnered with Gerber Life, a name trusted by millions of families like yours for over 50 years. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to help protect your family. Start investing with your child today at meetfabric.com slash how to. That's meetfabric.com slash how to. To learn some more details about the telegraph and see a demonstration of it, I paid a visit to the Pavec Museum in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. I'm Felipe Guiarte, and I'm the curator at the Pavec Museum. The Pavec Museum of Electronic Communication has been here since 1988. It was founded by Joe Pavec, Earl Bakken, and Paul Hedberg. Originally started with Joe Pavic's original radio collection, and that's why we have his name in the front. And we have expanded since to all forms of electronic communication, starting with telegraph, all the way to computers. What we have here is a simple circuit. So this is the key, this is the sounder. Uh, every time you hold down the key, completes the circuit. And that makes these two electromagnets move this metal bar up and down to hit the metal, and that's what you hear as a dot, a quick, or a dash, a longer hold. Uh, and from those two, Samuel Morse designed a whole system to be able to write. So it's always a one-way street, which is one of its limitations. Uh, and one of the things that people tried to, and later did manage to improve. So at the beginning, it could only transmit like a mile Basically, it's limited by the amount of juice, the amount of power you can put in. Uh, and the more power, the farther it goes, but it starts weakening. So really what it does is a stronger, more sensitive electromagnet that would pull on this hammer to start the chain. 
So basically it would replicate what the key does mm -hmm. by very being very sensitive about what it felt. Even though people could not hear after a certain amount of distance, electricity was still going far enough that you could reamplify it. Right, and that's what relays would do. The key changed a lot of design from the original patent by Morse. Uh, so if you see the original patent, Morse just had a metal bar that would like pivot up and down to complete the circuit. Later, telegraph users discovered that the, called the Camelback was more ergonomic. It would prevent what they would call glass arm, what we know as carpal tunnel. And then the sounder, what you have is two electromagnets that are completing the circuit and then a, a metal bar with a spring that's bouncing up and down. And the important thing there is that the sounder needs to make sound when it connects and when it releases. When it comes to building our telegraph, there are gonna be four main components. The batteries, the wire, the key, and the sounder. First up, the battery. In order to send a current through our network, we're gonna need something to provide the actual power. I actually explored a few different options before in previous videos. The very first battery was the voltaic pile, which had some serious downsides with its low power output and a very short lifespan. Next up was the Daniel cell. We first tried the earlier porous pod version of it, which was promising but still a bit underpowered. Then we switched to the gravity cell or crow's feet version of it. This battery seemed very promising. However, it was going to require a decent array of them for enough power. Using an array of these batteries, we were even able to power a modern cell phone. After that rat's nest of cables, I did some rearranging to try and get a little bit of a cleaner arrangement of the batteries to provide us with enough power. All right, give it a taste. Is it spicy? Yeah, yeah. Uh... 8.76 volts, exactly. Next up is the wire. I did a whole video exploring the early techniques of wire pulling after some earlier failures in my past. The obvious need for wire is the telegraph line so run the distance we are trying to communicate over. However, the other crucial need is a wire that we can coil around some steel to form an electromagnet. The thinner we can make our wire, the stronger an electromagnet we can create. For some extra force in pulling our wire, we broke out the big wheels. Just remember, I can't stop right as soon as you say stop. <laughs> so crazy. we tried to see how thin we could go. Nine inches, so five feet. It's a shame because I don't want to break it. It's already like how many hours worth of work? Oh, got it. got it. Ultimately, it ended up starting breaking on us around the 20 gauge mark. Oh. 
Secondly, we need to be able to insulate the wire so it doesn't touch itself in the wire. For that, we look to an old recipe used by Thomas Edison that involved the few ingredients we had access to. Asphalt, linseed oil, resin, and wax. Working her out. Next up is the key. This is the device the operator uses to type the actual message. It's pretty straightforward. Some pieces of brass that are attached with a spring so you can easily tap your message into it. When depressed, the circuit of the telegraph is completed and sent to the sounder. Lastly, the sounder. This is the device which receives the message from the key. This is where the electromagnet comes into play. The flow of electricity through the wires creates a magnetic field. And by coiling it around a ferromagnetic metal like iron, it can be concentrated to create an artificial magnet that can be activated or deactivated through the application of electricity. When the key completes the circuit, the electromagnet activates and pulls the clicker down. And when deactivated, it releases it up to make the clicking noise. A message is then sent by the varying durations and gaps between the clicks. We started with our original electromagnet, and this is from what we built when, the, when we first pulled wire. Uh, I believe this is actually steel wire instead of copper, and then we used cloth insulation for the most part. The biggest drawback with that, of course, is we can't wind the wire as tight as possible. From there, I was basically experimenting with various types of just store-bought electromagnets to play with different windings, different ratios of the length of the steel rod, different size steel rods. It turns out you don't need like a ton of windings. Uh, we found historically they only used between like 100 and 200 windings, which is what brought us to our final iteration here. This is our own hand-pulled copper wire. We got it down to, I think like, was it 20 gauge, 21 gauge, something was around there, uh, which is pretty good considering we did it by hand. Um, we then did our homebrew insulation on this, and then I was able to get about just over 200 windings per electromagnet. We noticed um, in a lot of the like example and historical examples of telegraphs, they used two electromagnets instead of one. And the key is, is that they would then connect 
the bottom of them so you're basically forming a horseshoe electromagnet and this metal piece in the middle is effectively what couples the two magnetic fields together because these are both wound the same way one of the polarities of these will have to be reversed which just means wiring one of the two magnets opposite of the other um, and we're hoping that'll be enough juice to power our telegraph with all the components ready it's time to take everything out into the field and see if it actually works in the real world when they're spread out a little bit more than a couple feet. So for our test, we chose a stretch of woods a little over a quarter mile. Why? Because I also live my life like Dom Toretto. I live my life a quarter mile at a time. So here is our setup we've got so far. We think we've got everything working, um, but there were a few challenges along the way. First of all, originally we tried doing a ground return setup for our telegraph, meaning we basically just had one power transmission line and then grounds on both ends. And your plan for getting that out? However, um, it doesn't look like we're getting a strong enough signal to be able to send Morse code over the line. So we ended up doing a second return line. We've got two uninsulated but separated positive and negative lines um, hooked up to our key and our Daniel cells. Um, we've got 20 Daniel cells running in series for a total of 20 volts. After some preliminary tests, we did get our sounder on the other end a quarter mile away to tap out um, some Morse code. So. Here's hoping we can actually send a meaningful message a quarter mile away. I have the secret code that needs to be made to the other end of our course. So I'm going to race our telegraph now and hopefully I can beat it. Uh, people in the comments have mentioned that it is not the speed of light. It is actually slower than the speed of light. So I think I stand a chance. I do have the advantage that they have to encode it and decode it. Um, other than that, we'll see how fast I can go. Here is your code and I am off. Wrong way. <laughs> Telegraph wire in the way. <sighs> you gotta do it. Wire, duck. <sighs> Over halfway. Hopefully, it's working. There's not enough to run for no reason. I don't know why I'm so tired. Oh. Oh. Right. I'd be able to easily run this. You're just been in the sun all day. Under the wire. Oh. 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 You don't have to bother. I already got the message. It's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> <laughs> So while this device is actually pretty simple, actually getting it to work in the field over a long distance proved to be quite the challenge. We never got the earth return system to work. We added some extra voltage from store-bought batteries and still just could not get it to work. I'm not entirely sure what we did wrong and how they were able to get this to work in the past, but in the end we ended up having to run a second line to complete the circuit. 
but even then it took a lot of uh, finessing and uh, making sure the battery is working up to full power and uh, adjustments to the magnet and the spring and everything to get it to actually consistently send a message over the line. But in the end, we did succeed. So while the Telegraph is a pretty simple machine and has pretty limited capacity and type of information it can send, made the world so much smaller. Before this, the concept of instant communication was impossible. It would take at least weeks and even months to get messages from our other sides of the world. This changed that and suddenly you could send a message anywhere in the world in nearly an instant. And what I find fascinating is that this is really the biggest step for basically the internet and everything we have today. Like once you have the concept of building networks with wires between different hubs and branching all over the world and the idea of encoding messages to be sent through that line, there's not a whole lot different from the modern internet. I mean, there's a ton of stuff in between it, but conceptually there's only small steps to get there. Whereas this first step was a huge leap. That was the hard part. So the message I ended up sending was, what hath humanity wrought? Which is a reference to the very first message that Samuel Moore sent through his telegraph, what has God wrought? Which is basically an exclamation of what great things God has made possible. I wanted to kind of invert that. So I made it, what hath humanity brought? To kind of invert it and like, what has humanity made? Cause this, in many ways was Pandora's box. And a lot of the issues we face today with being perpetually online and always in constant connection traces back to this invention and what this unlocked. For all the good things that this has brought, it's also brought a lot of bad. So I just wanted to bring that full circle and kind of re-examine that and what, what have we made here? This is probably our most technologically advanced device that we've built so far. It was a huge challenge. Getting everything to work was hard. We're bringing this to open source. So everybody who attends there will be able to test it out and actually send their own message using this device. And it should get interpreted and then sent through a modern internet to your cell phone. Thanks again for watching. Thank you to all my supporters on Patreon. We're starting this new thing of basically a little bit long form conversation between me and the other people who work on the channel to kind of go through a little bit behind the scenes of the projects and have a little bit longer discussion. So if you want to be able to access some of that content, check out our Patreon, consider supporting us. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.